Today we've got a revenge story about making an ugly baby uglier? We'll get into that in a bit, but first, my project partner didn't do anything for the project, so I made sure he was held responsible for it. When I was in 7th grade, I was at a private school, and for a project for one of my classes, I got paired up with the worst person in my class. Over the weeks of the project, the PowerPoint presentation that we had shared with each other was only touched once by him, and all he did was create a new slide, left it blank. I was ticked. For the first time ever, I absolutely refused to do all the work. My idiot of a partner thought I was doing all the work for him and smiled at me every time classes started looking smug. He never even bothered to check the PowerPoint. Little did he know that I'd already informed our teacher, and that teacher gave me his blessings to just present my part, and I would be graded on that alone. The day to present came and we were to present our projects to the entire school. Before the presentation started, he came up to me and asked if he could see the PowerPoint so he could prepare to speak his part. I just glared at him so hard he visibly paled and went back to his seat, where I continued to give him the stink eye the whole time until it was our time to present. Luckily, I was in charge of the first half of the PowerPoint, so I started things off. I knew I hit it out of the park based on how our teacher was nodding his head from the back of the room. At the end of my last time, I turned and looked at my partner, who had gone pale despite all of his freckles. Alright, insert partner name here. Ready to present your part? I didn't bother waiting for a response and just clicked the clicker. A blank slide showed up on the screen, exactly what he had contributed to the project. And then the PowerPoint ended. It took a few seconds for people to realize it was over, and there was the general hubbub of confusion. Finally, the principal stepped up and asked my partner what was going on. Mr. Freckles looked away and mumbled something about it being on a flash drive left upstairs in his backpack. He was allowed to leave the room to go retrieve it. I stood there in front of the whole school, smiling to myself for 10 minutes. The idiot still hadn't returned, so my teacher suggested we move on with the presentations. A couple of teachers left to go find my partner, who was quickly found hiding in a closet in one of the classrooms upstairs. I got a 98% on the project, and the idiot got a big fat zero. He ended up failing the class and had to redo the year. Before I left private school and went back to public schools for high school, he had managed to get kicked out of the school program, and I never heard from him again. Can we just give some props to the teacher here who allowed the kid who was not getting any help from their group partner to do their half of it and just get graded on that because that's totally fair. The ones that are devastating and you hate to hear about are the ones that let you just sink because somebody else doesn't want to help and leaves you out to dry. Also hi, I'm Steven and if you wouldn't mind liking this video or leaving a review if you're listening to my podcast, that would be amazing. That said, our next story is, single snowboarder won't share a gondola with another snowboarder, so shared with three Aussie skiers instead. So we've, me, male 60, and two sons, 26-year-old male and 24-year-old male, have been skiing in Japan for two weeks. We've noticed that in Japan, people rarely share lifts, even though there are signs to do so when there are queues, but there are rarely queues. So today, we're in a hurry to get back to make our shuttle bus, three lifts to catch to do so, and find there's quite a queue for the first gondola. Fits six people. Most people are getting on in groups of two, three, or four. Two singles in front of us. The lift operator asks the second single to join the first. He shakes his head and points to the second gondola, so as soon as he's on, the three of us jump in behind him. So instead of having a comfortable ride with a fellow countryman and snowboarder, he has to share with three loud Aussies who are also skiers. Simple and on the spot. To be fair, in a situation like that, I'm not outgoing. It would be uncomfortable to share a ski lift or whatnot for me. But at the same time, I wouldn't have an expectation that I can just hog one all to myself. You gotta give him props though, he tried. He almost got away with it, if it weren't for the three of them hopping in right after him. Our next story is, I can't sell food? Fine, I'll sell the plates then. I stumbled across the subreddit and decided to share a story of petty revenge from my youth. 14 year old me was a menace to society. She had her fair share of respect for authorities and rules, but if you tried to impose a ridiculous rule on her and she found the tiniest of loopholes, she'd exploit it to kingdom come. Set the scene, I'm in middle school and it's almost Easter, so every class is putting up a kiosk for a bazaar. You are allowed to sell anything, legal, obviously, crafts, pastries, art, etc. My class wants to make some money to fund a trip. I've always liked cooking and making desserts, so I offered to make crepes for us to sell. 
I get up at an ungodly hour every morning and make them to make sure they're fresh. I wear gloves and a hairnet and make sure to sanitize everything to ensure it was safe. My classmate brings bananas because his dad owns a grocery store. Someone else brings honey their relatives sent to them because they live in a rural area, etc. You get the point. Team effort. We are up and running in no time and making mad bank. At lunch break, we always have a huge queue of kids waiting to buy our crepes. Unfortunately, that means that the other kiosks aren't getting as much business. We're on good terms with most of the kids from the other kiosks and they're chill about it. One kiosk has more traffic than others because they're giving out one to two homemade cookies with every purchase. So after a few days, the girls from the cookie kiosk come over to us along with the headmaster. He says that we can't sell food anymore because it's unfair to the other kiosks. I point out that the girls are also giving out cookies, to which he replies, you can give out whatever you want for free, including food, but you can't sell it. It's unfair competition. Again, if he had shut it down because of a health concern, we would have dropped it at the bat of an eye. Health is no joke. But claiming that it was unfair that we had a good business idea just didn't sit right with me. Everyone else was free to do what we were doing. I keep thinking about what he said. You can see where this is going, right? We were serving the crepes on those generic white paper plates. So, I buy a food safe marker, flip some plates over and start doodling in some classmates with a knack for art follow suit. We did mostly cartoon and anime characters. Then I hang some plates up around our kiosk and change our sign to cartoon character art to currency sign apiece, plus a crip of your choice with every purchase. And we're back in business. Just like clockwork, the cookie kiosk girls are back at our kiosk with the headmaster again the next day. I thought I made myself clear, he says. You did, sir, I reply and point at the sign. After a long silence, a calm face palm and a long... I don't get paid enough for this, sigh. He relents and I give him a crepe on the house. He also suggested I become a lawyer. Well, did OP become a lawyer? Definitely a really good compliment. Unless people are telling it to you because you're trying to make a deal to get a cut of the money. Our next story is revenge against a female colleague who tried to take credit for my work. It's my first time writing, so apologies for any mistakes and if it's too long. This happened a few years back. I was working for a large IB company. I was actually from a back office role, but people from back office were frequently allowed to be in front office whenever the front end team had shortage of staff, so I went to the front office for a month. After a few days, I was assigned a project in which I and another female analyst, first year, had to update a 70 page deck in two days. The VP was recently promoted from associate role, so we didn't have any other associate to the project. For context, most people from back office who go to front office it didn't matter if they get the credit of work or not, since they only go to enjoy this all-expenses-paid trip to a big city. They don't have any intention to work full-time IB because of long working hours, ruthless work culture, etc. And since, they didn't work with the same intensity like a regular analyst. They are usually not offered full-time role. Only once in three to four years there would be a person with strong skills who would work like an actual analyst with intention to get a full-time role. I was way above average in my skills compared to other guys who came before me. Since I was working in this field for almost 5 years, I was better than most first year analysts also. The other female analyst knew my skills since she'd worked with me before, so she thought that she could get me to do everything by sweet talking to me and then presented like she did it to get all the credit. Since it didn't matter to me, but she was wrong in that assumption as I was there trying for full time role. She would always come to me and say like, I have another urgent project that needs to be done urgently, can you please do one slide of mine? After every slide, she would just give more of her slides to me again while she's sitting and having chats with the other analysts. While working, we would frequently send the work in progress version of the deck to VP and the VP would then review it or ask for clarification. Now, whenever the VP would ask any questions related to the slides that were supposed to be done by the other female analyst, she would come to me and ask what she should reply. Now here, I knew I had to do something to get the credit for the work, so I would reply directly to the VP before she could even come to my desk. When she came to my desk, I would act innocent like I didn't understand her intentions. I would explain to her what the clarification was and then tell her that I'd already replied, since when I looked towards her seat, she wasn't at her desk because she was on her way towards me. This happened like six or seven times, so now the VP knew it was actually me who worked on all the slides. 
The female analyst was a little dumb, so she didn't understand what was happening here. After all the slides were done, we had to take printout and give it to the VP for review. Naturally, the VP asked me for it. I printed it and was going towards the VP when the female analyst came and said, Oh, this is very petty work. You shouldn't do this. You're a big guy. You did all the work anyway. So let me do this and you take a rest. In a very sweet way. I knew what she was trying to do and I'd already laid down the trap. So I said, sure, thank you, and let her do it. Now, the VP on the project was a very scary person and the entire team of analysts was afraid of working with that person. She went to the VP, gave the print of the 70-page deck, smiling all the time thinking that now she would get in the good books of the scariest VP on the floor. As soon as she gave the print, the VP started shouting at her right there, saying, Why are you here alone without OP? You anyway did nothing the entire time, I know that. Go and bring OP since he did all the work on this. She was back to my desk within a minute with a sad face, asking me to come with her. The VP reviewed the deck, gave bunch of the changes, allocated most of it to her, thanked me for all the work on the deck, especially since there was no associate on the project, and asked me to play the role of associate and review all the work that the female analyst will do going forward. It was the best feeling I'd had during that entire month. She never understood what happened or how the VP came to know that I worked on all slides, so my relationship with her was not hampered. We were still good friends till I was in the company. And I also made a good impression in front of a VP, which helped me when I applied to full-time role in that office. What I like about this VP is they're scary. Sure, people are afraid of them, but it seems like they understand when somebody is giving them good work and doing a good job. You can live working for somebody that you fear, but you know that if you're giving them good results, they'll respect you. Honestly, it's probably a healthier work dynamic to have that with your boss rather than being very buddy-buddy. Our next story is messing with the homophobic slash racist guy my grandma married after he kept asking me, a teenage girl, if I had a boyfriend. This happened about 17 years ago, but I was reminded of it today and had a good laugh, so I thought I would share. Backstory, when I was about 12, my grandma divorced my grandpa and got remarried to this guy I'll call Bill. Bill was in his late 60s from East Texas and as religious as they come. And from what I'd heard from others and things he'd said over the years, I was pretty sure he was homophobic and racist. Thankfully, I didn't see him much since they lived several hours away. But on certain big holidays, mostly Christmas, we'd all pack up and go stay with them for a few days to celebrate. Being a 12-year-old girl at the time, Bill made me uncomfortable, mostly because every time I saw him, the first question out of his mouth was inevitably... Do you have a boyfriend yet? Is there a boy you like? Etc. Sometimes he'd ask multiple times during the same trip. Every single time. I hated it. I'd just answer no and go hide out in the spare bedroom so he couldn't talk to me. The petty revenge. A few years later, I was around 17 at the time. My mom told me grandma and Bill were coming to town for Christmas that year. My sister was heavily pregnant, and her due date was a few days after Christmas. There was no way we were traveling and risking her going into labor so far from home. I must have made some kind of face because my mom asked what was wrong, and since I'd never told her, I explained how Bill creeped me out and was always asking me about boyfriends and stuff. I popped off and said something to the effect of, I swear the next time he asks me that, I'm going to tell him I have a boyfriend and a girlfriend. My mom, being a crab starter, was like, do it. So we made a plan. I was straight back then, but I had a lot of LGBT plus friends in high school. And one of my best friends, Mindy, was bi. We would use her name to make it sound natural and easy to remember all day instead of a fake name. I asked Mindy ahead of time if it was okay, and she was all for it. She just wanted the details afterward, and if anyone else in my family who wasn't in on it asked me about Mindy, it would just add more credence to my lie when I talked about her or brought her up in conversation. The boyfriend was going to be all fake because I had a plan about him. Anyway, me and my mom are standing in the kitchen, and Bill is sitting alone at the dining room table nearby. My mom, again, a crap starter, doesn't even wait for Bill to ask. I think she wanted to watch and didn't want a chance on missing it if Bill asked while she wasn't around. A reenactment of our short conversation. So, how is Mindy doing? I was so sad when she said she couldn't come. Mom looks suitably sad. Okay, so we're doing this now. I reply, yeah, I know, but she had family visiting as well and couldn't find time to get away. 
I turn and lock eyes with Bill, and since he was listening in on our conversation, I feel obligated to explain. Mindy is my girlfriend. The look of shock and dismay on his face was so satisfying, he said something to the effect of, Are you serious? And at that point, it was on. Oh yeah, Mindy's my girlfriend. She's super nice and very pretty. I'm sure you'll like her. Oh, and we also have a boyfriend. His name is insert historically Hispanic name here. I think it was Julio. But I mean, there's no way he could come. He's still in prison right now. I can just see his eyes getting bigger and bigger with everything I said, and I am having so much fun with it at that point. I mean, they say that he's in this gang and that he killed this guy, but I know he totally didn't do it. Julio is so sweet and I love him so much. He treats Mindy and I so well, there's no way he could have done it. That's right, honey, my mom said. He'll get out soon and the three of you will be together again. Hopefully the wedding won't have to be pushed back. The best thing was that he couldn't even call me out on my lies because my mom was right there agreeing with every word I said. In the span of about three minutes, I had this man believing that not only was I gay and dating a woman, I was also dating a Hispanic guy who was in a gang and in prison for murder. Oh, and that we were all thinking of marriage. He did not talk to me for the rest of the holiday. I did notice him giving me strange looks, but I didn't care. As far as I was concerned, mission accomplished. The aftermath. I had to ask my mom about this part because I didn't remember. I forgot about Bill as soon as they left. She told me my grandma confronted her. Why did you tell him that kind of stuff, etc.? Mom explained why and that it wasn't his business, but grandma thought what I did was worse and that what he had done was just small talk or wanting to get to know me. In the end, I don't think I ever saw Bill after that. Grandma left him a few years later and that was that. I like to think he didn't believe my grandma when she told him it was all lies and that he's still in East Texas thinking about the crazy granddaughter of the woman he used to be married to. I love OP's mom being in on this plan, being fully willing to push it and promote it, and making this intolerant guy not only think crazy things about OP's life choices but to disgust them enough that they're willing to consider just giving up on that whole section of the family slash friends sector altogether. Our next story is Revenge on the Office Karen. This is not my story, it belongs to a friend of mine. I couldn't stop laughing at the subtlety and nuance of her win this week and have to relate it. A is an executive assistant for the CEO. While she works for mostly one person, there's an executive team that she also does some work for and one of these is C. C, for want of a better word, is the epitome of the office Karen. She takes great joy in being condescending, rude, taking credit for everyone else's work, and throwing people under the bus. Difficult to work with is a bit of an understatement. When A first started working there, C reported her to her boss for attitude on a number of occasions, when all A was doing was trying to hide her frustration because C was deliberately being obtuse and making A's life unnecessarily difficult. A's boss is well aware of the friction, however C is actually very good at her job, and she's clever enough not to cross lines that will get her in deep trouble. A decided if she couldn't beat him, she'd join them, in the best and most subtle possible way. Earlier this week, A ensured her boss overheard her talking to a client, praising C to the heavens. It was actually a real client call, not faked. When she hung up, her boss praised her for being the bigger person and talking up C despite their relationship. When C came in, the boss made a special mention to her that A had been praising her while A just sat there smiling innocently at her. C was not happy about this, but couldn't do or say a thing without looking like a butt. To put the cherry on top, the following morning, A greeted her with, C, you look so tired, are you okay? Can I make you a coffee? C said no and stomped into her office. Every time she came out, A proceeded to say, You really don't look well. Are you sure you're okay? Is there anything I can do for you? Meanwhile, A's boss overheard all of these exchanges and once again praised her for setting aside their differences and trying to make things work. By the end of the day, C was visibly seething and A was the boss's new favorite. We believe C may well be a basket case by Christmas. I love this because there's not a moment where they can speak up against this and she's just having to slowly learn to despise her job so much more because of their just pure rage for this person. If they were smart, they should start taking up the hospitality and just having them make coffees for them all the time or something. Maybe A would finally stop talking to them in that case. 
Our next story is, my ex's ex and I unknowingly got revenge on our ex. I, in my 20s, female, was dating a guy, let's call him Brian, for about 9 months. He broke things off with me to get back with his ex, Jenny. He didn't want to live his life not giving them a second chance to see where things would lead. I was crushed and angry. I would look them up on social media occasionally and later found out Brian and Jenny got engaged. Shortly after, I met my boyfriend and his name is Brian too. Around that time, I got a text from a number I didn't have in my contacts. I asked who it was and they said, it's Brian, the one and only. What a loser. I ignored him. Little didn't he know I was dating a Brian, so certainly he was not the one and only I knew. I looked him up on Facebook and saw him and Jenny were no longer together. Jenny was with a new guy, also named Brian. Anyway, my boyfriend Brian and I got engaged and have been married for 10 years now. And Jenny, she married her second Brian too. It makes me laugh and feel oh so very good to think this guy thought he was so special. Revenge is sweet, especially when I didn't make much of an effort. Now, my question is, does Brian know that he was replaced by two separate Brians? Because if so, that is legendary and I wonder how he must feel about that. It's one thing to see your exes go off and be happy in other relationships, but it must feel a specific type of way to see them go off with two different Brians and be happy and marry them. This next story is parking as usual. I'm in a school car park reading my paper whilst waiting for 8.30 a.m. as I have some work to carry out in the school. A Range Rover pulls in beside me so close that I have no chance of getting out of my car. Woman gets out and heads into reception. I reverse out and then park on the other side of her vehicle, so she is blocked. Give it a short time to go into reception, make myself known, and head off with the site manager. Return to reception about two hours later. Receptionist asks if the white car is mine, as there was a lot of fuss earlier because one of the parents was complaining about being unable to get in their car. I acted all innocent. The receptionist said the driver had been demanding my car was moved, but she eventually had to climb in through the passenger door. However, she was a larger woman, so she struggled. I apologized, but the receptionist started giggling and said the woman was a pain in the butt and was always there complaining and demanding to see the head teacher. She showed me the video of this woman getting into her car, and it was rather enjoyable. Honestly, at that point, if somebody was humble enough and they came in and was like, hey, I could really use some help here, can somebody get in my car and just back it out for me? Like, if it was hard for her to climb in through the passenger side and get over the center console? Maybe somebody in there would have been willing to help, but not for somebody that's coming in there raging and making everybody stressed out. Our next story is, get rid of my cat? Okay, I'll get rid of your dogs. I, 22-year-old female, have a difficult relationship with my father, 60-year-old male, to say the least. I've tried to have a good, loving relationship with him my entire life. But he isn't the nicest person half the time. He can't hold a job or get along with someone for more than a month before blowing up over something. He yelled at me a lot for growing up and practically scrounged for things to be mad about constantly. His fits have become less frequent but no less frustrating. Anyway, since I've moved out five years ago, he's gotten two new dogs. Our previous ones passed away of old age or were puppies that were rehomed. We used to keep a lot of dogs and cats growing up and occasionally some wild animals that were injured until they were nursed back to health. My dad got very attached to a squirrel we had in my middle school years named Junior. One day I came home and dad said when he let Junior outside to play, he came back in to do something. And when he went to call him in, yes, the squirrel responded, yes, I know this is weird. He found the squirrel in a less than desirable state with my cat Polly. He said that since Polly got rid of Junior, he got rid of Polly. He didn't rehome her. It was traumatizing, honestly. I came home last week to see my mom, but I decided to visit my dad since he was only 5 minutes down the road. I got there, spent about 15 minutes with him, and then he blew me off to go get some weed from his dealer, still illegal in my state. Before he left, he showed me a cute ornament he bought for his Christmas tree of a squirrel in honor of Junior, because he saw it in one of the feed stores in town. I asked where the ornament for Polly was, and he said that cat was garbage for what he did to Junior. A couple of days ago, I visited again and he ditched me again. While he was gone, the landline rung. It was the dog catcher from the local pound. 
She said she picked up my father's two dogs for the third time this month. Not surprising, he doesn't leash them and has them live outside half the time. I decided to leave, go to the pound, fill out info, and pay a small fee to owner surrender the dogs. They were taken to a no-kill shelter one town over the next day to find their next forever home that will actually feed and house them properly, and pay to give them updated shots and stuff which my dad also doesn't do. My father found out what I'd done when he went to the pound and has been spamming my phone to the point I had to block him. He's also posting about what an awful child I am on my Facebook page, and some of my relatives have reached out, asking if I actually turned his dogs over. Many of them agree with me, but a couple think I took things too far. I don't feel bad anymore, and I don't care what my relatives think. I've finally decided after so many years and so many bad experiences to just go no contact with my father. But finally getting one over on him and making sure his latest pets have been moved into actual caring homes was definitely icing on the cake. He doesn't deserve to have pets, or kids, or really anything that has to rely on him for basic necessities. Freak him. I think almost anybody is going to agree that OP did the right thing here. Personally, I don't think dogs deserve to live half their lives outside. I think it's incredibly neglectful if you leave your dogs outside on their own for hours on end, especially in a place where they're not contained and it's much more likely that they might run into danger, whether it's like on a street with cars or some kind of wildlife where they're going to maybe run into something that can do some damage, especially if they're not the biggest of dogs. Our next story is, I made my manager's ugly baby uglier. Years ago, I worked for a large retail chain under your typical promoted because he's one of the boys, manager. He didn't do much that actually needed doing in our department, and even foisted things like employee reviews, product resets and counts, etc. off on me. He mostly hung out shooting the crap with his buddies and chatting with customers, although he didn't sell much, because he always tried to push everyone towards the highest end product, even if a more moderate one would suit the customers better. The company rewarded him with prizes like trips and gadgets for our high sales. Sales that I largely made with a team I trained. And then he would brag about all the cool stuff he got. I didn't like him much. One thing he loved talking about constantly was his baby. Maybe nine months old. He even made a picture of the little tyke, the wallpaper on our display computer. I get being a proud papa, but on top of me already being annoyed with him for being a crappy boss, his baby was weird looking. Nothing was wrong with the baby health-wise, but it was bug-eyed and big-headed like its daddy. This was especially highlighted because babies are already naturally a little like that, and this kid was like if Megamind freaked a pug, and I had to look at a picture of it all day and all the customers saw it. So I went into a photo editing software and increased the size of the kid's eyes by about another 10%. Not enough for daddy to notice, but enough that it was startling if you were seeing the picture for the first time. Uncanny Valley vibes. People would subtly react when boss man showed them the picture and talked about the kid. Like they wanted to say something, but absolutely knew they should not. It was small, it was petty, and I still giggle about it years later. Hopefully the kid grew up to look like mama. To be fair, most babies that you look at and you're like, oh, X feature is so big, it's just because they're kind of having to grow into it, right? I think pretty much everybody can relate. I think pretty much everybody can relate to having some situation where you see a picture of a baby and there's probably some proud, beaming parent sharing it and you're like, not gonna lie, in the back of my head, that's not the most photogenic baby I've ever seen. But you just smile and you say, oh, that's so precious, congratulations. You must be tired. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another awesome revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.